this is a strange attractor. This is where we let loose of our of our control issues and 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 uh, let the work bring us to new forms. I studied for a short while with uh, Robert Stackhouse in Florida, a New York artist, currently living in St. Pete. And he described his own work practice as being uh, circular. In other words, he would, he would go on a, on a, his work would change and evolve and he would come back to the same place. He began as a painter. He took up sculpture because he, painting to him was boring. Um, so he would come back to the same place, but every time he would come back to the same place, time had changed, he had changed a little bit. So he described his work as kind of a, uh, as a spiral. So I would imagine his work being an attractor as opposed to a strange attractor. We revisit his work, he builds sculptures and museums and galleries and creates large scale watercolors. More about him later. Uh, somebody else that I that I studied under at the University of South Florida is the opposite of a strange attractor. A very min meticulous painter, landscape painter, color for color. He knew exactly what he was going to get when he was done with a painting. This we we often applaud. We applaud that kind of mastery, and I think that it's a good thing to applaud that kind of mastery. What I'm talking about is the, is the ability to let this kind of thing go in order to bring ourselves to new plateaus. Thus enter John Wenger. Uh, John Wenger lives in outside of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, he's a nut. And, and uh, about once a year, Donna and I go back to, uh, to visit him in, in the desert and kind of see if he's still alive and still making art. And uh, he certainly is. And he's the one who had told me first about this idea, the, the strange attractor from chaos theory being used by artists. Uh, this is one of his images, Threshold Lantern, 2009. Certainly not a typical uh, New Mexico painting. He works in a, in a way that he kind of consumes the landscape and then creates paintings from that. Um, but he described, uh, when we go to look at the, uh, the art that's on many of the cliffs, the rock art in New Mexico, he also describes the way that ancient peoples would use uh, Datura, for example, in, the, in order to reach a heightened state. He, he commented, that when one ingests the tura, sorry, the whole word is gone, that you end up feeling like what the cliff drawings look like. So these drawings on the wall were representations of a drug-induced state. And there's a popular, and it's still popular today, that the more drugs you do, the better you can make art. Um, I don't particularly concur with that. I don't disagree with it, but it's, it's not my bag. But the idea of certainly introducing a foreign substance can uh, send you to places you've never known about. Back to John Wenger. Another one of his images, Sparks and Tinder. He talks about after we get used to working in a certain way, we end up recreating ourselves. So he, he mentions break your brush in half and tape it back together so that it wobbles. And then as you're painting, you suspend judgment. Because the marks that you're making are really not controlled and are not part of your uh, mental oath, if you will. But um, something uncontrollable, something in a way to find new forms. And then after these new forms are created, you can then figure out what's useful and, and what's not. Uh, Magenta Duet, another one of his paintings. And his paintings are layered, layer upon layer upon layer until he arrives at the final image. He studied with a guy named Philip Guston at uh, an academy in Rome. The, I'm not sure what it's called. Some academy in Rome. Philip Guston, this is his works with the Works Project. 
uh, something WPA. What does that stand for, Nancy? Works Public Administration. Works. Works Public Public Administration. administration. Well, Thank you. Works progress. 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 Works Progress. Works Progress Administration. So they put all these artists to work, got them off the street, and fed them for a little while. Philip Gustin eventually evolved from that figure to <coughs> kind of painting to something that uh, John Winger described as the great eye. And, and I said, well, what's up with that great eye? And he says, some artists are really in, over involved in the way things look as opposed to the way things are. So what would appear to be backsliding on the, to some people for the work of Philip Gustin was actually more truthful, more to the point, and more critical of, um, of, of the, the viewing public. So with the, the great big eye, the eye falling in the palette, was very critical of realist artists who were concerned with the, the proper way to paint a toenail, for example, a fingernail. Let me get to Bryce Martin, a, an artist who I had seen in New York, and I didn't get him at the time. I was an under... I don't get a lot of stuff. But after a while, I asked some people, what's up with his work? And we can see here that he puts his brush, tapes his brush to the end of a long stick, and actually begins to develop a sense of gravity with his line making. This is his earlier work. Certainly very modern, and this, of course, would be later work. So by attaching the brush to the end of the stick, he relinquishes some of the control. You do this enough times, though, you begin to regain control. But he, I, would, I put this image up there, the dousing rod, the way that we divine for water. We allow a stick to gradually give us a sense of where water would be under the earth, not unlike the way Bryce Martin would paint each line creating its own gravity. Robert Longo, how do we get figures to look like they're dancing or being assassinated? Uh, an anecdote is I heard that they, he was standing on top of a rooftop shooting tennis balls at the models to get them into these strange positions. Uh, Marjorie Anger certainly working with controlled and uncontrolled media um, I studied with her for a short while at the University of New Mexico. Ceramicists. I, uh, Chris Leonard's here. Anytime you work with, anytime you work with ceramics, you take this clay and you put it in a fire, and you hope that it comes out looking like something. Or and and you're really relinquishing control of the way something looks to a kiln. So this, the kiln then would be a strange attractor. Jim Toya, somebody I met in New York, uh, this is him with his black eye, I think he plays rugby or some silly thing like that, also an artist, he'll place mushrooms on a piece of paper, cover them with newspaper, and allow the spores to do the drawing. And coming up with very beautiful floral kind of images or, or, or remnants. Also, this is a series his Target series, where he was poking fun at modernism, he would build these boxes and put millet inside of the boxes and drill a couple of very small holes and then allow the birds to come and eat away at the artwork. Giving the artwork over to the environment to let something else work on the art other than himself. Definitely the woodpeckers have.